Welcome to Amherst Reads, all of you alumni and others who may come across this on the Amherst website. The program today is an interview with Bob and Mary Bagg, who have written a wonderful biography of Richard Wilbur, just published, published by UMass Press. I urge everybody to acquire it. I got myself introduced to Dick uh, at a dinner that followed a reading that Dick did in Amherst. Uh, and there was a, and at this dinner I happened to be seated next to Charlie, and she asked me if I played tennis, and I said, yeah, which is true. And uh, she said, would you like to come out and be Dick's doubles partner? And I said, absolutely. So this was in the spring of 1984, as best I can reconstruct it, and there's a bit about it in the, in the book. So I've known Dick since then, and I knew Charlie pretty much as well as I knew Dick. Um, uh, for all that time. And then Dick and I co-taught courses at Amherst uh, when he was the Simpson lecturer from 2008 to 2014 when he decided he, that, you know, he was in his 90s at that point that uh, he probably should stop. Uh, we had a great time teaching. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in archives about that. I've been interviewed a couple of times about it. Uh, however, the focus is not on my friendship with them, but Bob and Mary's book. Uh, which I have read assiduously, and I can tell you that although I knew Charlie well and I know Dick well, uh, there's a lot of information in this book that I didn't have until I read the book, particularly about the, the war years. Uh, Dick said to me once that Bob and Mary knew more about his service in the war than he knew. Uh, and that is to say they really, really deeply researched the movements of the units and so on. And I'm going to ask uh, Bob and, and Mary to talk a bit about their conversations with Dick about the war. Uh, <coughs> Bob is an Amherst alum, class of 1957, which happens to be my class, but at another college. Uh, Mary, I've come to know through, uh, through the book, basically. Uh, I mean, I met her a couple of times before, but she was a full partner in the writing of this book. She conducted a lot of the interviews. She became cl particularly close to Charlie. In fact, I would say that Charlie and Mary had, a, and Mary still, a great gift for friendship. Bob is a poet. Uh, he was chair of the English department for some years at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, he's a translator from uh, the ancient Greek and uh, a formidable a formidable intellectual in his own right. Let's begin, uh, Mary and Bob, with some talk about Dick's childhood, parents and childhood in New Jersey. And so I'm just going to turn it over to you to speak a bit. Dick was born on a 400-acre farm that uh, was owned by a man named uh, Richard Dickinson Armitage. And so uh, he grew up uh, watching everything that happens in a farm from uh, milking the cows to slaughtering the animals. Um, he uh, went to, to uh, high school in uh, Montclair um, and in order to get there he had to, to go by himself seven miles, two miles of it by running across the fields and he uh, became a, 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 an, an amateur uh, runner most of his life. In fact, one of his poems is about the Boston Marathon. Called Running. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> he, from an early age, uh, in fourth grade, actually, uh, he became a Pied Piper of uh, all uh, the people and the kids around him. <clears throat> one day, he led uh, the entire school during a recess on a march around the school building 14 times until it was stopped by one of his um, teachers. Another time, he, since his father was an artist, he learned to, to draw at an early age. Uh, while his um, teacher was out of the room one day, he drew a caricature of her on the blackboard. And when she uh, came in, she was taken aback, and she pretty much could guess who the culprit was. And she asked uh, 
uh, Wilbur. Listen, I, I have to butt in here because <laughs> 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 All right. she asked the class, does anyone here know who did this drawing of me on the blackboard? <laughs> and Wilbur raised his hand and he said, I do, but I don't want to tell on him. <laughs> A whip forever. Right. <laughs> yeah. And he, <clears throat> his family had newspaper connections, and from an early age, Wilbur either edited or wrote for every newspaper that uh, was within reach. And he naturally became uh, the chairman of the Amherst Student. The chairman is the mm -hmm. title the college uses for its editor. And he uh, was a pacifist, and it may be difficult to understand, but prior to the Second World War, the uh, British Empire was thought to be an oppressor because uh, it had so many colonies and it, uh, and it uh, brooked no dissent or rebellion. So uh, he was um, still a pacifist when uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. But as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, he, uh, he wrote an editorial uh, to his fellow uh, students saying what he thought would happen and, and what uh, their responsibility would be. We all knew that we'd be in it soon enough, and it's just as well that it started this week as next. We are now relieved of the scholar's obligation to hunt a few plain issues in the war and can commence to act, which is simpler. We needn't rhapsodize over our intervention like the editor of the Williams Record, but we should suppress our obstructing doubts, confining our thoughts to the job before us and to the post-war world which it will be our great pleasure to put together. Now that we are fighting, what is needed is unanimity and determined action. If we feel any allegiance to the race in general, we will strive to make the post-war world more hopeful and less combustive than the world of the past 20 years, to which we are now bidding a noisy farewell. That's superb writing, I would maintain. Mm -hmm. Superb writing of prose. I doubt that <coughs> any national newspaper had a, had a more convincing or eloquent mm -hmm. uh, editorial on the 8th of December in 1941. Um, there are a couple of ways to proceed in the interview at this point. One is to carry forward into the war years because Dick <coughs> uh, volunteered or he was drafted uh, soon after graduation in the spring of 42 and he went off in the fall of 42 as a as a soldier. A long complicated business about his finally ending up where he ended up and but I'll let Bob and Mary talk about that. However concurrently <coughs> with Dick's uh, being a student at Amherst and a kind of cut up student. He liked to tell me stories about trouble that he would create at Amherst. I mean, innocent trouble to be sure, mm -hmm. but he, 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 was a, he was a wag as an Amherst student, I would say. Uh, very loyal Kai Sai. Fraternities were, were prominent at Amherst in his time. He was a prominent student at Amherst. He met Charlie, uh, Charlotte uh, Hayes Ward, who was a class behind him at Smith. And <coughs> the romance uh, sparked pretty much immediately, according to both of them. No reason not to believe that. And uh, I'd like Mary to talk a little about about the relationship with uh, between Dick and Charlie, and if you would like your own relationship with Charlie and mm -hmm. Dick. Well, Charlie's voice is really prominent in our book, as prominent almost as Dick's because if you look at the biography uh, as we did as a sense of preserving their oral history, that was uh, the chance that we had to interview him and get his words on record was important to us. And of course, that's how we came to know them both. 
Charlie and Dick met on a blind date, and Charlie had a very preconceived notion about her own idea of what she was looking for in a husband. And she had some fantasies as, as a young girl. His name had to be Richard, and in that <laughs> she meant Richard Coeur de Lyon, of course. Uh, he had to be a poet. He had to be an Amherst grad, and all these things turned out to be true uh, about, um, about Dick Wilbur. Yeah. And so they met on a blind date. Uh, he picked her up at Sessions' house. They walked hand in hand from about two seconds out the door into the town of Northampton to the Draper Hotel. And one of the things that Charlie told me that um, David has asked if I read from, which is, a, is something that she told us about her first sense of Wilbur and who he was, so I, I will read yeah, that. Yeah, it's an extraordinary passage, yeah. and passage in life. In 2005, Charlie discussed her immediate awareness of Wilbur's talents, choosing the word combo to describe their essential partnership and the support that sustained their long marriage. Quoting Charlie, I guess I wanted to free Dick to work, which is one of the first things that entered my mind when I fell in love with him. He had an extraordinary mind and sensibility. What he was going to do with it, I had no idea. I just knew when he went off, he was going to be a racehorse, she said. But although he was six feet, two inches tall, and a striking presence on campus with many accomplishments and an engaging personality, Charlie really felt uh, that, that Dick himself, as he described himself, was odd. And that was the great thing that her relationship with him did. It seemed to free him and give him an exuberance the two of them together shared. They married in, in 1942, as soon as Dick graduated. She decided not to go back to Smith because uh, Smith had very strict rules about women marrying when they were under the age of 21. And so she went to him uh, with him, and they lived in New York while he was doing his, his um, cryptographer's training. Uh, Dick spent uh, six months learning how to operate uh, a combat radio and how to uh, use a code machine. When uh, an event happened that got him kicked out of uh, training that involved uh, codes and secrecy, there was a routine uh, search of every uh, soldier's um, footlocker. And when uh, the um, <clears throat> footlocker inspection happened, uh, it was discovered that he had a copy of Karl Marx's Das Kapital in, uh, in his footlocker. And that, in those days, was enough for a super cautious uh, army, particularly where uh, secrets like uh, codes were involved, uh, uh, so serious that they kicked Wilbur out of training um, in the Signal Corps and busted him to uh, Buck Private. And he was uh, a Buck Private um, uh, who was sent to an enormous camp. There, there were altogether a million people there during the course of the war. They were malinger, malingerers and other undesirable soldiers. Well, the American Army lost a whole lot of uh, men during the invasion of Italy. And so uh, people who were, who were thought to be unsuitable for uh, action were uh, sent back uh, uh, to units in the war. And Wilbur was sent uh, back to um, Italy. And uh, he uh, arrived at the Hippodrome uh, uh, near Naples, an enormous place. Uh, along with some of his other undesirables. Uh, he was walking across uh, the infield when he heard over the loudspeaker, Richard Purdy Wilbur, please report 
to the headquarters of the Texas 32nd Division. And so Wilbur went over there and he was interviewed by the uh, uh, officer who headed the Signal Corps. And it said, uh, Private Wilbur, it says here that um, you're thoroughly trained in, in radio and uh, uh, code work. Is that true? Wilbur said, yes, sir. It also says here that you want to overthrow the government. <laughs> Do you want to overthrow the government, Private Wilbur? No, sir. Well, the uh, officer said, uh, we'll take you on, but if we catch you overthrowing the government, <laughs> out you go. <laughs> and he didn't overthrow the government. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a, an extensive service in Italy and in France and in Germany, a little in Austria. He was in Vienna when the war ended, he told me. It's in the book. Um, <clears throat> reflecting back on the war, he wrote in his journals. It's one of the most valuable things in the book, from mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. opinion, because this is material that has never been in print before. But in the years that he was at Harvard, and we'll come to Harvard in a minute, uh, right after the war, he kept journals and Bob and Mary quote four, four entries, extensive entries from those journals uh, in which he says things that he only said in those journals. And I would ask uh, Bob, if you would, to read uh, <coughs> from the journal in which Wilbur speaks about being in Ecretac on the Norman coast of, of France. Uh, in which he he writes mm -hmm. in a way, you know, not for publication to be sure, but here it is. So it's on page 111. And it's extraordinary. Uh, it's one of the revelatory moments for me uh, in reading this book. So, Bob, would you read that? Yes, a, a, a little background. Mm -hmm. um, even though the war was not over, uh, soldiers were given leaves, and Wilbur had um, a leave that would take him to England, where mm -hmm. incidentally he could um, uh, meet his uh, brother, who was uh, uh, also working there for uh, uh, an intelligence unit. And he had to wait uh, almost a week before he could get uh, a passage from uh, uh, the coast of France to England. and. During that um, time, he suddenly felt a huge sense of relief. And in his journal, he uh, described that uh, sensation. My own feelings of release, coupled with the fresh plenitude of the place, then full of the spring leaves and always cruised by sea winds, combined to bring about an unprecedented intoxication in me. One evening, I actually kissed the leaves of a tree with tears pouring from my eyes. All natural things and even the walls of the houses I approached with a free sexual adoration. I touched everything. In writing poetry, one tries to approximate this universal libidinousness. I think of Robert Frost, Gerard Hopkins. When it is achieved, I wonder what manner of love it has been. The infant affects only his unknown self, or rather, his belly and his skin milk, softness, warmth. In manhood, love is more and more objectified, yet is concurrently channeled and solidified. Is the investment of multitudinous outward things with sexual love, a growth beyond the adult civilization, and departmentalization of desire? Or is it a drawing of all things back into the penumbra of infancy? 
What an astonishing passage. Yeah. Um, truly, <coughs> truly revelatory. Nobody uh, <coughs> has ever imagined Wilbur writing a passage like this, and the poetry is not reflective of this kind of a passage very much. Uh, <coughs> but this is deep, deep Wilbur, and he means every word of this. Uh, you two remark in the book at one point that he's, as a love poet, the most monogamous ever among the major <laughs> American <laughs> poets. And I'm, I'm sure that's true. Uh, so after the war, as Bob has told us, uh, he was in England for a bit, uh, came back and was admitted to Harvard as a graduate student in the English department uh, in the fall of 1946. Uh, he spent 1946 to 1950. At the end of that first year, he was chosen to be a member of the Society of Fellows, which is the most, there's nothing more prestigious at, for a young person at that age in American academia. Uh, there's a lot written about the Society of Fellows, and I imagine anybody listening to this knows something about it, but he thrived there. It released him from academic duties. Uh, he did not finish the PhD degree that he had embarked on, but it's a good thing that he did not, in the sense that it freed him to write poems. To write poems that he had been writing, he'd been writing all through the war. One of the great virtues of, of Bob and Mary's biography is that uh, <coughs> there are quotations of whole poems and parts of poems at numerous points in the, in the war years chapters of the biography. Uh, Wilbur chose to publish practically none of his poetry that he'd written in the war, a couple of poems only. And he got to Harvard and was, you know, he was released from all the anxiety that combat, and he was in combat for years. He was in the, in the assault on Monte Cassino, right, one of the bloodiest battles in the entire Second World War in the European theater. Uh, so he's, he finishes his service, the war is over, He's in Etretat, he writes this extraordinary passage that Bob has read, goes to England for a while studying literature, comes back to Harvard, is chosen to be in the Society of Fellows, which frees him from coursework. And he decides to write more poems, and he does write more poems. And the story of, of the publication of the first book of his is worth, Mary, you want to say a word about it? Because it's, it's not the way it usually happens. <laughs> Well, he had written uh, in the foxholes. There's a wonderful uh, little passage where he talked about what else could you do in a foxhole except write yeah. a poem. Right. And there wasn't a lot of room there to paint, for instance, you know, what other form of art could one do? And uh, one of the poems that he wrote that was actually published uh, is called Tie Water. And he had a copy of a draft of that poem when he was still, was he, he was in France there, is that right? That was, um, I believe that's when it was. And he, the, the one war spoil that he brought back was a copy of a German poem, book of poems, and he put the, the Tidewater copy in that book and brought it home. And then his friend, André Dubouchet, An Amherst he, graduate. Amherst graduate, yes. And he met him at Cambridge and, and Andre found the draft of the poem inside the book and then said to Charlie, oh my goodness, and of course, you know, Dick had a sheaf of poems by that time, and that was very much the beginning of, of the manuscript for his first book of poems. Right, which was published in 1947, so, so right. not mm -hmm. long after Dick had started at, at Harvard. The book was mm -hmm. uh, acclaimed. Um, he was seen from the publication of that book uh, <coughs> to be as, as likely a, a young American poet to have a major career as there was. His principal competition, and it's a word I don't shy from using here because the generation of, of poets that Dick was found himself born into uh, included Robert Lowell and Randall Jarrell and John Berriman, Anthony Hecht, wonderful, wonderful poets of the caliber of, of Dick, James Merrill, a little while later, although Merrill was in the army at the end of the war, and his friend, their friend, David Ferry, 
class of, what, 1947, although he started earlier, but he was in the Army. All three of them were in the Army. That's a generation that uh, is coming into its own critically in the, I mean, I'm saying this out of self-interest in part because I teach those poets in a course and have been doing so for a while this coming fall, the last time ever probably. So I'm retiring. In any case, uh, <coughs> that was an extraordinary group and they all knew each other. I would add to the group the poet that I think is Dick's equal, maybe a couple of the other, a couple of the others are as well, but Elizabeth Bishop. Dick had mm -hmm. correspondence with all of those writers. Uh, <coughs> it was complicated. Uh, the poet that he was usually put up against was Robert Lowell, uh, who was four years uh, older than Dick and also famous as a poet very early on, the way Dick was. And so critics fastened on these two and you, we were asked to some extent to take sides as a reader and certainly as a, as a critic. Uh, as time has gone on, I think it's probably fair to say that Lowell's reputation has receded some. Uh, Elizabeth Bishop's has come up mightily. Uh, and Bob and Mary's biography, I'm, I'm confident, will help restore Dick Wilbur's reputation, which is very high as it is. It's not that, that people have forgotten him. He's but published poems uh, as recently as, as 2010, right? Nine books of poems, the most recent one, Ante Rooms, which I think you uh, say had a provisional title uh, that is not the title Ante Rooms, which is the title of a, a poem in the book, but rather a measuring worm. And in a footnote, I'm, this is, I'm feeling very clever as a reader here because what Bob and Mary say in a footnote is that a friend suggested that might not be the likeliest title. And I think that friend was, I know that friend was, <laughs> but not named in the book, was in fact Bob Bagg, who's been close to Dick for a long time and was reviewed by Dick, in fact, uh, when Bob's first book of poems was published. So Dick moves on from Harvard. I know it doesn't actually move on from Harvard. He's taken into the faculty in 1950, and he serves in the faculty until 1954. I said, what happened once, a, not that long ago, I said to Dick, what happened then? And he said, well, the English department put me up for tenure, but the then president of Harvard said, we've got enough poets around here. Uh, <laughs> and Harvard is a very difficult place to get tenure in. Usually you get it later in life. Uh, so Dick got a job nearby at Wellesley College where in fact he only taught for a couple of years before he went to Wesleyan in 1957 and served as a regular member of the faculty, although slightly irregular in the sense that his contract did not require him to do some of the more onerous uh, functions of being a, a faculty member that Bob knows a lot about and I know a lot about. That is to say he didn't have to sit in on meetings determining whether younger faculty would get tenure and he was grateful for that. So it was a wonderful appointment and all power to Wesleyan which established a poetry series with Dick as editor uh, not long after Dick was there. So after Wesleyan he goes to, they have a house now in Cummington, Massachusetts. He and Charlie, the children are, are raised and off uh, and they deci he decides to resign at his appointment at Wesleyan in 1977 and moves to Smith as a visiting writer for 10 years. Uh, I know not a lot about that, but he just taught visiting writing, taught poetry writing at Smith in that time, I'm sure you know more. And then 20 years of not teaching at all until Tony Marks, the then president of Amherst College, decided to offer him the position that Robert Frost has held. Frost, who in my opinion was a major, major influence on Dick in something like the second half of his career and a good influence, an excellent influence. But Dick and, and Robert Frost had met when Dick was at Harvard because Frost was not teaching at Amherst any longer. He resigned in 1938 from his position uh, when his wife Eleanor died. So he would come back to Amherst a bit. But he was offered the position of <coughs> uh, Simpson lecturer to get him to come back, Simpson after the trustee uh, lawyer Simpson uh, of Simpson Thatcher Bartlett. And Frost came back in 48 and was on the Amherst faculty but not doing a lot of teaching until he died in what 1963. Uh, 
when Dick was offered the job by Tony Marks, Dick was, a, as a teacher, self-confessedly uh, an over-preparer and somebody who never thought that he had a, a natural teaching style. Uh, this is in the book. It's, it's true enough, but in point of fact, when I taught with him from the time he came back in 19, uh, 2008 until he retired in uh, 2014, he was not, not a complicated teacher particularly. And Dick and uh, <coughs> Bob and uh, Bob and Mary describe in the book uh, Dick's teaching with me in classes from those times because they came to a class or two and it went it went well. I'm here to tell you it went well and the teachers were enormously appreciative. At that point, of course, Dick was a great and famous personage and in American literature, and especially, of course, as a, as a poet. So let's turn a bit to uh, Dick's career, which is the raison d'etre of the book, finally. Uh, this book would not exist if he, Dick had not become. Uh, by the time Bob and Mary took it up, they were asked by Charlie to write this book. Uh, they accepted, thank God, the assignment. Uh, <coughs> but it's a long career, and uh, Bob, would you speak a little bit about the kind of poet you think Dick is, uh, and as you present him in the book? Yeah. Um, Dick did not believe um, that poetry uh, benefited from being obscure, uh, and there have been uh, <coughs> times uh, in the history of poetry when obscurity was seen seen as a virtue. So, uh, it happened uh, in, in France. It did not happen in the ancient world in either Greek or, or uh, Latin poetry. But, um, and Dick also thought that uh, poetry should describe uh, moments of uh, appreciation of the natural world, of uh, one's fellows. Poetry should be celebratory uh, uh, much more than ironic. And there are very few angry poems in uh, Wilbur's work. The most famous instance is his denunciation of Lyndon Johnson for uh, <clears throat> doing what John Kennedy would not have done had Kennedy lived, uh, and that is to uh, uh, attack Vietnam. Uh, and it's the, uh, uh, Dick said that he did not like the sonnet form, and in fact there are only four sonnets in his mm -hmm. uh, entire work. But uh, the sonnet is uh, uh, a powerful instrument for uh, uh, concentrating one's uh, uh, anger and, uh, and adverse judgment. As in Milton, for example. As, uh, yes, <laughs> as in Milton. I think that uh, as w we've discovered and shown in some of the correspondence that you were talking about with Bishop and Lowell particularly, that um, Dick was criticized during that period especially for not being a confessional poet right. and for not speaking about his emotions. And there are some famous cases of that um, in the poem that got him into trouble, Cottage Street, 1953, for instance, uh, his denunciation, or as it was interpreted about Sylvia Plath, and I think one of the amazing things that happened to Dick in, in his older years, and, and this is especially true after Charlie's death, was his ability to write about his emotions in, in such a way that is so, in some ways, heartbreaking. I know that we'll talk about that later when we talk about Charlie, but that passage that Bob read earlier is an early instance of that. Um, mm -hmm. One of the poems that was an early poem to Charlie 
the title I don't remember immediately, but it, something about June pears <laughs> was yeah. this beautiful image of handing his lover, uh, you know, the the ripe pears. You know, all this imagery of the natural world right. with emotion, right. and I think that that people that read him carefully will see that and understand that about his poetry that it was deeply personal in that sense. It just That's wasn't right. confessional in terms of his anger. Uh, and a lot of that comes from his Christian faith yes, and his I, belief yeah. in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the c Christianity you know? is uh, uh, an extremely uh, Im important presence in uh, Dick's poetry. Uh, Dana Joya, who was um, a friend and uh, poet and, and uh, critic, uh, counted the number of poems in which religion appears. And he says one third of, of Wilbur's uh, poems have it have uh, belief in Christianity. Uh, At in least them. implicit. In, in, implicit, yeah, definitely yeah. implicit. I mean, yeah. I think you can read them and not be aware of it, and at the same time right. not miss That's anything right. from right. from the poetry. But I think in in his sense, in his personal sense, his faith is really what has helped him, especially in the ten years since Charlie died, that he believes you know, that he has a faith that yeah. helps him to be optimistic, his optimism and his hope. He's a hopeful person. Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. And so these are the elements of his Christian faith that come out in the poetry, not so much the, you know, the articles of his faith as in right. Episcopalian. Right, right. right. He it, said he um, can say the creed, but that's not what that's not most what interests he means. him and right. sustains exactly. him. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that belief that sustained him is the same belief that runs through his poetry and his just sense of a hopeful human being. Yeah. But it didn't enter his poetry until his uh, pre to Rome year. Right. In, in um, uh, 54, 55. Right. He was living in Rome uh, and uh, Charlie uh, wanted to talk to Romans and she would spend some days just wandering through the streets and striking up conversations, and her Italian got uh, pretty good. Whereas um, Dick was uh, struck more uh, by the uh, magnificence of both the uh, Roman church architecture, uh, St. Peter's, he has a poem about uh, St. Peter's Square, and also uh, about uh, by the uh, Christian belief, um, and I, th I think the uh, Christianity entered his work uh, more and more often after this this uh, year in Rome. It's got to be right. Yeah, and yeah. I think probably his his um, most spectacular success among the Roman poems is uh, for a Baroque wall fountain in the Villa Shara. And the Villa Shara is, is uh, a small park and it's, um, uh, it's on the, the uh, Genicolo Hill in Rome and it is only a few hundred yards from the grounds of the American Academy where Wilbur um, uh, had a studio and where they uh, often ate their meals and, and um, lived with the other fellows. And while uh, walking to work every day, Wilbur would pass through the Villa Shara and there would be this wall fountain with these interesting creatures, fawns, small people, and a kind of scrim of water falling over them. His word. Scrim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another ambitious uh, poem that uh, originated in Rome was uh, his poem called The Mind Reader. And the mind reader was a real person who you could visit in a, a cafe in the uh, Pantheon Square. It was a, right across from the, the temple which became a church. Um, and as it happens, uh, we came across a one-page description 
of the technique used by the mind reader. What the mind reader would do would talk to, to some person, it was all the conversation would be in Italian, and he would say, uh, he would uh, give them advice, uh, answer a question. All they had to do was write it in Italian on a piece of paper, and the mind reader would um, take it and hold it in his hands, and then after meditating a bit, answer the question. And one of uh, uh, Amherst, uh, an Amherst professor, John Moore, uh, wrote uh, a, a, very, a very exact description which uh, fully echoes what the poem, what Wilbur's poem says about this fellow. Uh, and uh, Moore believed that uh, the mind reader was able to take a sneak look at the, <laughs> at the question, and that would improve the chances of, of giving an acceptable answer. A little sleight of hand, he That's called great. it. Yeah. But um, Wilbur uh, thought about uh, the powers of this uh, mind reader, and he, he extended these, these uh, powers in his poem metaphorically to the power in the mind of God. Uh, there are uh, places in the Bible and, of course, uh, in, in uh, Shakespeare in which uh, the poet celebrates the ability of God to read the mind of every human being, regardless of his status or even his language. And uh, this uh, uh, celebration of, of the connection between humankind and divinity, uh, which I think is, is uh, uh, the most uh, powerful representation of his own Christian belief, is in the, this uh, poem, The Mind Reader. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's also in the shorter poems, that is to say, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you say this in the book, both of you, that that Dick is fundamentally a celebratory poet and what he descriptive and celebrates, he describes and celebrates the, the natural world as well as especially the natural world, but also of course the, the world of, of mankind, uh, rather than being another kind of poet such as Elizabeth Bishop was, although she's very good at describing the natural world if not quite celebrating it the way Dick does. She was not a religious person. Dick, Dick is. I suggest we read a couple of poems, just to, because I can imagine people listening to us saying, "Well, it's time, you know, read us, read us a couple of, a couple of poems from the mm -hmm. beginning of this 1956 book, Things mm -hmm. of This World," which won Dick Wilbur all the prizes there were. He won prizes throughout his career, but this was what I would call a breakthrough year for him. He had two books before this and a bunch of books after, like half a dozen after this, but this is when Dick came to the, the widest attention as a poet. So, uh, poems that I propose that we read, uh, Bob, if you'd read Love Calls Us to the Things of This World, mm -hmm. the Villa Shara poem is magnificent, but it's very long and it would take a little too long mm -hmm. for us to do like the mind reader, but these are this is a, a lyric poem, a kind of extended lyric poem of immense cleverness uh, and also faith and, and celebration. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, the title of the poem, Love Calls Us to the Things of This World, uh, which also uh, gave Wilbur the title of, yeah. of the book that won his, him his first Pulitzer, uh, comes from uh, St. Augustine. The eyes open to a cry of pulleys, and spirited from sleep, the astounded soul hangs for a moment bodiless and simple as false dawn. Outside the open window, the morning air is all awash with angels. Some are in bedsheets, some are in blouses, some are in smocks, but truly, there they are. Now they are rising together 
in calm swells of halcyon feeling, filling whatever they wear with the deep joy of their impersonal breathing. Now they are flying in place, conveying the terrible speed of their omnipresence, moving and staying like white water. And now of a sudden they swoon down into so rapt a quiet that nobody seems to be there. The soul shrinks from all that it is about to remember, from the punctual rape of every blessed day, and cries, Oh, let there be nothing on earth but laundry, nothing but rosy hands in the rising steam, and clear dances done in the sight of heaven. Yet, as the sun acknowledges with a warm look the world's hunks and colors, the soul descends once more in bitter love to accept the waking body, saying now in a changed voice as the man yawns and rises, bring them down from their giddy gallows, let their be clean linen for the backs of thieves. Let lovers go fresh and sweet to be undone. And the heaviest nuns walk in a pure floating of dark habits, keeping their difficult balance. One of the most brilliant poems to come out of English language poetry in the last, what, three quarters of a century. I would read the poem that precedes it um, in Things of This World, the book, 1956, uh, which is Altitudes. It's the opening poem in the book, then comes Things of This World. The Villa Shara poem is later in the book. Uh, I choose to read this simply because it's, well, not simply because, but it unites the year in Rome with Dick's New England experience and particularly the experience of Amherst as he imagines it in the person of none other than Emily Dickinson. It's in two parts. Uh, the first is set in, a, in Rome, clearly not a specific church, although very possibly St. Peter's. Then it goes this way. It's in stanzas. It rhymes, of course, as almost all of Dick's poems, except the longer ones, like the mind reader, do. He is the most accomplished rhymer in possibly the history of American poetry. I mean, I would can't best that. since the, the best, best since um, in the English language, since uh, Dryden and Pope and Keats. I'll accept all of those, especially Pope, who was a particularly <laughs> brilliant rhymer. So altitudes, one, look up into the dome. It is a great salon, a brilliant place, yet not too splendid for the race whom we imagine there, wholly at home, with the gold rosetted white wainscot, the oval windows, and the faultless figures of the painted vault. Strolling, conversing in that precious light, they chat no doubt of love. The pleasant burden of their courtesy borne down at times to you and me where in this dark we stand and gaze above. For all they cannot share, all that the world cannot in fact afford, their lofty premises are floored with the massed voices of continual prayer. Two. How far it is from here to Emily Dickinson's father's house in America. Think of her climbing a spiral stair up the little cupola with its clear small panes, its room for one. Like the dark house below, so full of eyes and mirrors and of shut-in flies, this chamber furnished only with the sun is she and she alone a mood to which she rises, in which she sees bird choristers in all the trees and a wild shining of the pure unknown on Amherst. This is caught in the dormers of a neighbor who, no doubt, will, be long, will before long be coming out to face about his garden, lost in thought. Before we end with a reading, each of us will do a particular poem 
from the later career of Dick Wilbur. I would ask Bob and Mary uh, to say a word about uh, what doesn't get covered very thoroughly in the book but is important to, because it, there was a page limitation imposed by the press. Uh, about Dick as a writer of prose, as a translator, and as a writer of books for children and others, as Dick said. In 1952, I believe, he went to Corrales on a Guggenheim Fellowship, and he had been influenced um, by the idea of T.S. Eliot to write, you know, verse drama because Eliot had been on the Harvard campus and heard, Dick had heard this particular lecture. And so Dick decided he was going to go and write his own verse drama, and he got the Guggenheim to do it. And when he was there, he ran into some difficulties in his mind. And Charlie said, well, I think you're right. You know, you're, you're only writing in your own voice. It was hard to get a conversation going. In a, in a play. In yeah. a play. Yeah. And he had been fascinated, uh, he remembered from their time in France that they had gone to the Comédie Française and they had seen many, many plays by Molière there. And he began to translate Molière there in Corrales. And that was the, you know, the pivotal moment that, that got him interested. It drew Charlie into his work. She was extremely fluent in French and also um, in a different way than Dick was. And they worked together over the course of his life. She very quietly by his side, um, and in many cases, as we describe in the book, with little complaints here and there to good friends. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and it, it was part of what she talked about that I read earlier, but they were the combo. And that right. was her way. Perfect. He, you know, she was his primary reader of his poems, but they work side by side sometimes on the translations. The sure. translations of Moliere, especially later of Racine and Corneille, enabled him to become financially solvent in a way that many poets of his era could not, even poets that were teaching. And uh, went on, right. he did Candide, of course, on Broadway, which we have an entire chapter about. But and that which, is by the way, I just saw a production of for the first time <laughs> about <laughs> a month and a half ago in New York. Yeah, yeah, you know, that was wonderful. wonderful. He, yeah. he was, there was someone doing that. So yeah. anyway, his translations uh, of French playwrights um, are masterful. Are, they're wonderful. They're amazing. Yeah. I mean, his sense. And, and those, of course, then he does write some beautiful introductions and describing his, his choices, but Bob can tell you more about his other essays. Yeah, first yeah. I'd like to uh, uh, report that uh, it was not uh, easy to get uh, perfectly natural flowing rhymes. Wilbur uh, would never um, invert the language of uh, a speech just to get the rhyme. It all had to be conversational. And he said, often I have um, um, s spoiled a perfectly good afternoon for tennis by trying to, to, to get uh, uh, a couple of rhymes right. Yeah, yeah. When we were teaching uh, the writing of poetry to our students at Amherst, I asked him once, Did you ever, do you ever use a rhyming dictionary? I mean, he's the most inventive rhymer. He said, never, never. And mm -hmm. you've worked with manuscripts of his, as have I, a little bit, and you'll mm -hmm. see possible rhyme words. Once he's got a word that he needs to get a rhyme with, uh, he writes up, you know, like half a dozen or ten of them, and some of them astonishing words, and then chooses the right one that, that, yes. that fits into the colloquial context of the, of the poem. Yeah. In fact, the, uh, the uh, Amherst Archives has uh, an, an immense Wilbur uh, collection and uh, David has just mentioned the, uh, the manuscripts for some of his uh, translations mm -hmm. and in which um, he, uh, he lists rhymes uh, and uh, possible translations that he later rejects in favor of the right one. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's a real treasure trove to say the obvious uh, in the archives of the college library. And there may be a future biographer. Uh, Bob and Mary have both said 
that there's a lot more material than they were able to put in the book. Yeah. You know, so there can be a bigger biography at some time in the, in the whenever future. We'll, we'll see. One of the uh, subjects uh, that we did not explore very much was um, Wilbur's role as a um, artistic and, and uh, creative spokesperson. Uh, he spent eight years uh, basically running the American Academy of Arts and Letters, first as president and then as, as uh, chairman of it. And it was uh, Wilbur who um, thought that the limitation of 50 members of the Academy uh, was way too small for the uh, 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 huge uh, spectrum of American talent. Uh, uh, visual artists, musicians, composers, as well as uh, no novelists, essays, and poets. Right. And uh, he succeeded in, in, uh, in making the change. Mm -hmm. Which has persisted. It's great. Yeah. It's good service. Uh, I'd say simply a sentence about the books, and there are, there's a handful of them, for children and others. Uh, they are immensely clever, uh, witty, humorous, and readable. And uh, ch I, I can testify that my own children, when I read them, some of these to them, back when, a long time ago, but uh, were quite delighted by them and, uh, and and they're an important part of Dick's work that is because the work is so expansive and in so many genres that gets overlooked uh, more than it than it ought to. Uh, I propose that we bring this to an end by reading three poems from the later books. Um, <coughs> Mary could read if she would the great poem The Reader which is one of the monogamous love poems that Bob writes about, has spoken of. And Bob, if you'd read The Ride, the reader, The Ride, which is a poem that I hadn't paid a lot of attention to until Dick and I started teaching together and he gave some readings at Amherst. And he always began readings in the, in the last, what, 15 years as far as I know, with the poem The Ride, uh, which is the first poem in the book in which it appears. Then I'll conclude with uh, just one part of uh, one of his most autobiographical poems. It looks back to three moments in Dick's childhood and then foresees uh, what is still to come. So Mary, if you would read the reader, please. The reader. She is going back these days to the great stories that charmed her younger mind. A shaded light shines on the nape half shadowed by her curls, and a page turns now with a scuffing sound. Onward they come again, the orphans reaching for a first handhold in a stony world, the young provincials who at last look down on the city's maze and will descend into it, the serious girl, once more, who would live nobly, the sly one who aspires to marry so, the young man bent on glory, and that other who seeks a burden. Knowing as she does what will become of them in bloody field or Tuscan garden, it may be that at times she sees their first and final selves at once, as a god might to whom all time is now. Or, having lived so much herself, perhaps she meets them this time with a wiser eye, noting that Julian's calculating head is from the first to severed from his heart. But the true wonder of it is that she, for all that she may know of consequences, still turns enchanted to the next bright page, like some Natasha in the ballroom door, caught in the flow of things wherever bound, the blind delight of being ready still to enter life on life and see them through. That's a wonderful reading. Thank you. I mean it. Bob, The Ride. The Ride. The horse beneath me seemed to know what course to steer through the horror of snow I dreamed. And so 
I had no fear, nor was I chilled to death by the wind's white shudders, thanks to the veils of his patient breath and the mist of sweat from his flanks. It seemed that all night through, within my hand, no rain and nothing in my view but the pillar of the main. I rode with magic ease at a quick, unstumbling trot through shattering vacancies on into what was not till the weave of the storm grew thin with a threading of cedar smoke and the ice-blind pane of an inn shimmered and I awoke. How shall I now get back to the inn-yard where he stands, burdened with every lack, and waken the stable hands to give him, before I think that there was no horse at all, some hay, some water to drink, a blanket, and a stall. Excellent, excellent. This pleasing, anxious being, which takes its title from a line in Gray's Elegy, uh, depicts three moments of childhood. Uh, one, a uh, Thanksgiving dinner uh, in Dick's childhood this is, so it's an autobi autobiographical poem for sure. Uh, the second being on the beach somewhere. Uh, his father is painting and Dick and his brother are are frolicking and there's a picnic hamper and so on. And then it turns to uh, <coughs> a trip that the Wilbur family took to Baltimore uh, <coughs> and in, in a snowstorm when Dick and his brother Lori were children. And this it is. And it foresees the end, the end. Wild lashing snow which thumps against the windshield like earth tossed down upon a coffin lid, half clogs the wipers, and our Buick yaws on the black roads of 1928. Father is driving, mother leaning out, tracks with her flashlight beam the pavement's edge, and we must weather hours more of storm to be in Baltimore for Christmas time. Of the two children in the back seat, safe beneath a lap robe, Soothed by jingling chains and by their parents' pluck and gaiety, one is asleep. The others, half-closed eyes, make out at times the dark hood of the car plowing the eddied flakes and might foresee the steady chugging of a landing craft through morning mist to the bombarded shore or a deft prow that dances through the rocks of the white water of the Allagash or, in good time, the bedstead at whose foot the world will swim and flicker and be gone. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank yeah. you, David. Thank you, Amherst.